Hello, 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 and welcome to the Common Constitutionalist Weekly Podcast, and I am, as I always am, the Common Constitutionalist. And today I want to speak about a couple of spoiled rich kids that are embarrassed about the legacy that have made them spoiled rich kids. I also want to speak about Saudi Arabia and Guantanamo Bay and just how dirty that whole combination is. And last but not least, don't do drugs. If you do drugs, like LSD, uh, you may end up being a wacky son of a gun like the man in the Czech Republic who thinks he was a tiger. All this today on The Common Constitutionalist. You're listening to The Common Constitutionalist, broadcast from an undisclosed location, free from the prying eyes of establishment left. So what do you do? You've grown up your whole life, your parents' lives, their parents' lives, their parents' lives before them have grown up, and all they've known is billions of dollars, okay? You come from an incredibly wealthy family, a one of privilege, and you know nothing of anything but that. It's just you can go anywhere, you can do anything, and because of this, you you don't have to, you've never had to earn a dime in your life. So you have, you have a it basically it's a just a rudderless rudderless rich life, and so invariably or ultimately uh, kids like that become bored and they go out and they because they suffer from liberal privilege syndrome LPS we'll call it they go out searching they go, they go to find themselves or to find some cause to glom onto. And invariably, it ends up being some sort of dopey liberal cause. I, I don't know why. It never, en- <laughs> it never ends up being some sort of constitutionalist um, con- conservative cause. It always ends up being some jerky liberal cause. But, Dave, so, so be it. Uh, it's actually, I guess it's not really a mystery why it ends up being a jerky liberal cause. Because liberal causes, they do, you don't actually have to do anything. All you have to do is feel and emote maybe donate some money, uh, talk about it on Entertainment Tonight or something like that, and uh, feel good about yourself that you're actually making a difference in the world. So what do you do if your family legacy is uh, basically it's the poster company, the, the company that's made your family billions of dollars is the, the poster company of virtually everything evil in the world as far as liberals go. What do you do? Okay, so you're a you're a you're a child of privilege. Uh, you have uh, LPS liberal uh, privilege syndrome, and you go out searching for a cause to uh, to to make your to give your life meaning. And um, the problem is is that you're you you've, it's it's like double jeopardy here. You're looking for a liberal cause, but your uh, family's fortune is like I said, the poster child of virtually everything evil. And this is the this is the plight of some of the uh, the children of the of children of privilege from the Rockefeller family, you know the guy uh, John D Rockefeller who founded Standard Oil and then Standard Oil became Esso E S S O which is actually just the phonetic version of Standard Oil S O and became Esso S O E S S O and then in I think it was nineteen what was it ninety seventy two excuse me. 1972, it became Exxon. Uh, they bought Humble Oil or something like that, and then they became Exxon. And then in 1998, they merged with Mobile Oil, and so they became Exxon Mobil, the poster child for everything evil on the planet. And actually, it is the most evil corporation this side of, say, Philip Morris, the tobacco giant or something like that. There's nothing good about it, in, uh, in other words. There's absolutely nothing good about it. So if you're the children of the Rockefeller family and the, ch- the children of the Exxon Mobil fortune, you have got to be, if you're, if you're liberal leaning, uh, you've got to be absolutely racked with guilt. And particularly if your cause is, of course, global warming or climate change, as they like to call it now. Actually, the, the interesting thing is, is that they, for a while there, you didn't hear global warming at all. Everything was climate change because 
obviously the climate is constantly changing and it's the easiest thing in the world if you say climate change is man-made the minute the climate changes heck the minute the weather changes you can blame it on climate change so uh, at least a few if not many of these rockefeller privileged children uh, are speaking out against exxon mobil um claiming that they've uh, over the years they've made efforts to sweep global man-made global warming under the rug and in an interview with CBS this morning, Rockefeller uh, family members David Kaiser and Valerie Rockefeller Wayne say it's time that ExxonMobil admit they tried to downplay the signs of global warming. E sure. Two of the family's philanthropic organizations, which they still run, the, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the Rockefeller Family Fund, have used family money to fund research that showed, I'm sure conclusively, that ExxonMobil knew about climate change early on and did nothing to address it, instead producing advertising that criticized scientific research on the issue, uh, which was actually based on real science. Uh, that's how they concluded that there was no man-made global warming, is they actually did some real science instead of this phony crap that you see all the time. But it's, it's, fun, it's funny that the, uh, that the CBS morning interview uh, showed that ExxonMobil knew about climate change. Well, everybody knows about climate change. You know why? Because the freaking climate changes all the time. That's the that's the beauty of the claim of climate change. Anytime the climate changes, they can blame it on man. It gets colder, blame it on man. Drought, floods, whatever. Uh, and then eventually the climate is going to change on its own the way it always does uh, for millennia. And you can blame it on man. It's the easiest doggone thing in the world. But uh, they, they want to blame ExxonMobil for it because it's the, it's the liberal whipping boy, for want of a better term. Now, Ms. Valerie Rockefeller Wayne said that because, <laughs> because the source of the family wealth is fossil fuel, we feel an enormous moral responsibility for our children's, for, she didn't say children's, I just added that, for everyone to move forward. And she also added that the company has since acknowledged that climate change is, <laughs> is happening and says it's spending billions of dollars, and ExxonMobil, that is, is spending billions of dollars to find ways to lower greenhouse gas emissions that, uh, that all liberals agree is the source of climate change. And this is, I mean, this is a, a huge farce because... Um, ExxonMobil for for years had f had funded research the exact opposite. They funded actual scientific research um, that they, and it's obvious from the research that they did from independent scientists that there's no man caused global warming. It just isn't, and there hasn't been any global warming in what 15, 18 years now or something like that. We've been in a a pause, uh, an inexplicable pause. What a crock. But I guess if they, they want to throw millions of dollars away on good PR, then that's the way they've got to do it to keep the, the liberals off their backs or something. I don't, not that it's going to work because they're, they're never going to be satisfied anyway. And this, this is the, I mean, this is the perfect scam. Um, and even if you're not in on the scam, it's, it's, a, perfect, um, it's a perfect cause for, for, for the liberals and liberal mindset because it's, it can never be solved. That's the beauty of climate change. It can never be solved. As long as there's a climate, there's, it's going to change. It's going to warm and it's going to cool, and that's just the way it is. And, and so that's the, the beauty. This is a, it's, it's, Al Gore was a genius for spearheading this thing when he did back in, when was it, the 90s or whenever the crap it was. I mean, he picked something, like I said, it was genius. He picked something that can't be solved no matter what the climate is going to change. And so it's so easy to blame it on mankind. We could all disappear tomorrow and the climate's going to change, but it's like, a, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and you're not there to hear it, does it make a sound? Or if a bear blanks in the woods or whatever the crap, you know what I mean? If there's nobody, <laughs> if there's nobody to witness, no one left on the earth because we've all been eradicated or whatever, and the climate still changes, there will be nobody to witness the climate changing. 
So it's just it's just a, it is absolutely a perfect scam. And these fools, these multi-billionaire fools, fall for this kind of rot gut nonsense, and they fund these scam artists that uh, they cause that cause them to pay millions and millions of dollars into their phony foundations and their think tanks and research facilities for absolute squat. But it's a, it, you know, it's just, it, I mean, it's criminal is actually what it is. But hey, it's their money. If they want to blank it away, if they want to throw it away um, on whatever the heck they want to throw it away on, it's their money. My biggest gripe is the governments um, are, are getting involved in this. And more and more and more, they're funding virtually all the research. I mean, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars at this point in, in global warming research for something that we can't, we can't cause, we can't stop. The climate's going to change. It's pathetic. But yet these rubes, uh, it's just, it's amazing. It's just, it's, you know, it just goes to show you it doesn't matter how wealthy you are. Um, oh, oh, your vast wealth can't buy you any more, any more gray cells. But, of course, this isn't, this isn't just about global warming and climate change, as, as, we, as I said before. This is about their legacy of evil and how they want to separate themselves from the legacy of evil because they've, they've come to feel so guilty about how they, may, how they got their wealth, how they inherited their wealth. So they've got to do something to atone for their sins, and this is what they've chosen to atone for their sins. It's silly, but it's their money. And they're welcome to blank it away any way they want to do it. So let's take a break, a shall we? You're listening to The Common Constitutionalist. Let the truth be known. How many times can it be said in how many different ways? Saudi Arabia, the Saudis, the royal family are not our friends. I'd like to say that they never have been. As far as I know, they never have been. Maybe eons ago, maybe long ago, maybe they were our friends. But they certainly haven't been our friends for decades upon decades. And ever since the ascendance of modern-day terrorism, they certainly, should, they certainly haven't been our friends. As a matter of fact, they've been quite the opposite. They have been huge funders of, covert funders of terrorism, taking our oil money and then funding terror. So indirectly, the United States has been funding attacks on Israel and the United States. That's kind of blank backwards, if you ask me. But we love their oil, and uh, so it doesn't make any difference whether they fund terrorism or not, I suppose. We love their oil, so we will we'll put a cap on terrorism to some extent and continue to send them a gazillion dollars a year for their oil. But these people have been the they're the the uh, the backers of the Muslim Brotherhood worldwide, particularly in this country. They uh, what was it? Nineteen of the twenty terrorists uh, from the World Trade Center bombings, um, the, where the, the planes flew, in, uh, flew into the, uh, the World Trade Centers, the Pentagon, and that field in Pennsylvania. Nineteen of them were Saudi nationals. Osama bin Laden was a Saudi. As a matter of fact, they paid him off so he wouldn't come back to Saudi Arabia. He wanted to come back to Saudi Arabia, and they said, no, nah, we'll, uh, we'll fund you with millions of dollars for your terrorist organization, as long as you don't set foot back in Saudi Arabia, it was kind of one of those kill us last type of things. So needless to say, I am no fan of Saudi Arabia. I'm also no fan of uh, closing uh, the prison at Guantanamo Bay, of which Obama has vowed still before he leaves on January the 19th and a half or whatever the crap it is, he's going to close Guantanamo Bay. That's been his position since before 2008, and it's still his position today. And he's he's fast approaching that goal by uh, taking the Guantanamo Bay prisoners and dumping them into different countries that aren't friendly to us, including, now we find out, Saudi Arabia. He's been sending, releasing prisoners and sending them to rehabilitation centers in Saudi Arabia. 
Well, the interesting thing about these rehabilitation centers is they're not rehabilitating anyone or they're rehabilitating very few. As a matter of fact, the Daily Mail reports that an Al-Qaeda operative told a parole board at Guantanamo Bay recently that a Saudi reform program for terrorists is actually a front for recruiting jihadists. Recent uh, documents that were declassified claim, not claim, say, that Ghassan Abdullah al-Sharbi, I guess that's how you pronounce it, said that the program at the Prince Mohammed bin Nayef Counseling and Care Center which was thought to have played a key role in Saudi Arabia's counterterrorism strategy, is not what it appears. Evidently, dozens of Guantanamo detainees released by Obama, including, as you recall, Osama bin Laden's former bodyguard, have been sent through this program as a condition of their release by, uh, yes, a President Obama. And according to the New York Post, uh, the care center, what was this place called again? The Prince Mohammed bin Naif Counseling and Care Center is, um, it's, uh, it's compared to a holiday resort, and those who complete the 12-step program are rewarded with, dig this, young brides and new cars. What a deal. And those enrolled in the programs at the centers in Riyadh and Jeddah um, include uh, psychological counseling by religious clerics, and they try to integrate them back into society through activities like swimming, ping pong, and art therapy. But what, they're, what we're not being told is, uh, according to this um, parolee at Guantanamo Bay, Ghassan Abdullah al-Sharbi, the uh, Guantanamo prisoners that are sent to the rehab, Saudi Arabian's rehab center, is a really a front for recruiting jihadists. Isn't that fabulous? And uh, these apparently, they're some, these guys are some pampered jihadists, jihadists with their swimming, ping pong, art therapy, also including in the, in the package deal. Maybe it's an upgrade or something. Uh, or PlayStation, you can play PlayStation. You have gourmet meals and private apartments for conjugal visits. Maybe with your new young bride that you're awarded. Uh, she can drive your new car over for your, her conjugal visit at the uh, care center. Al Sharbi evidently told the parole board, you guys, this is a quote, by the way, you guys want to send me back to Saudi Arabia because you believe there is a de-radicalization program, and on the surface, this is true. You are 100% right. There is a strong de-radicalization program, but make no mistake, underneath there is a hidden radicalization program. Al Sharbi went on to add that he did not want to enroll in there in the Saudi 12-step program, fearing that he would be used to fight under the royal Saudi royal cloak. And they use this royal cloak of secrecy, supposedly. He says, when they release you, they want to make sure that you're still under that cloak and they got you to fight their jihad in their regions and in the states. And he also said that the Saudis are recruiting fighters to um, to be trained and, and then to face off against the Iranians in Yemen and Syria. So this is just, just, just terrific. Once again, the Saudis are showing what true friends they really are. Now, as far as this Al-Sharbi guy, why do we believe him? I don't see any reason why the guy would lie. He's been locked up in Guantanamo for a long time. It's not that he doesn't have... Uh, Sources from the outside world probably feeding him information or something, I don't know, probably from maybe United Nations inspectors coming in there and feeding him information. Wouldn't doubt that in the least. But I also suspect that this program from the Saudis, this de-radicalization slash radicalization program, has been going on for a decade or more. And um, so he probably knows full well what's in for it if he goes there. And if Obama decides to parole him and give him release and send him to Saudi Arabia to this rehab program. So do I know for certain that this is true, that the Saudis are actually training jihadists instead of trying to rehabilitate these people? No, but it sounds typical of exactly what the, the two-faced Saudis would do. They'll tell you they're, they're our friends, and then while you're not looking or you turn your back, they'll stab you in it. That's exactly what the Saudis do. They are not our friends, and they never will be. And this is just another indication of how, how wantonly blind 
the Obama administration is, and probably the Bush administration before them, that they didn't want to see the truth. Um, just like, in my opinion, I still hold to it that the Bushes knew full well that the Saudis had financed some of the nationals that blew up the World Trade Center and the Pentagon um, and didn't say anything because they didn't want to start an international incident with the Saudis or have the oil cut off or whatever reason. So they decided not to do the right thing, but to do the politically expedient thing. Do I know that for absolute certain? No, but it sounds about proper. And as far as the Obamas are concerned, they're just, frankly, they're just foolish. They, I don't know that they are aware of this program or whatever, but I think they're just foolish. He wants so bad to close Guantanamo Bay that it doesn't make any difference what he has to do or where he has to ship these people. It doesn't make a hill of beans you know, where they go as long as they leave Guantanamo Bay so he can fulfill his promise and close Guantanamo because that's all he gives a rat's about is his silly freaking legacy. And other than that, I got nothing strong to say about it. Be right back. You're listening to the common constitution. Let the truth be known. All right, a little Christmas music to calm the, the savage beast. Speaking of savage beasts, uh, what was that song, the Aerosmith song? Uh, what was it, Dude Looks Like a Lady or something, something like that? Um, well, this dude didn't look like a lady, this guy from the Czech Republic. Uh, he uh, also didn't look like a tiger, but he thought he was one. So evidently, the this uh, the this guy identified as Marek H. He's from the Czech Republic and he lives on the uh, the the Czech Polish border. He suffers from depression, and he decided that he was going to take LSD to uh, to uh, treat his de- <laughs> to, to treat his depression. I don't think that's doctor prescribed, but hey, I'm not a Czech doctor or a Polish doctor. And that could be well. Forget. Well, let's let's we'll save the Polish jokes for for another day. So anyway, this uh, this 21 year old genius decides to take LSD to treat his depression, and it I don't know. It may have actually treated his depression, but it also had a rather odd side effect. He instantly, the minute he t- <laughs> the minute he took the LSD, he started to feel different. He said he started to feel like a Siberian tiger, and so he uh, he he ran uh, into the into the forest, as uh, stripped off <laughs> stripped off all his clothing, and uh, and started prancing about like a Siberian tiger, uh, completely nude. It was very interesting. How they knew he did this? Well, that's the real interesting. Do you, I don't know if you guys know about trail cams or game cams. They are these cameras that they set up, and you can strap them to a post, or strap them to a tree, or stick them in the ground. And they have uh, they have uh, infrared flashes, so they don't disturb the wildlife. And they'll take high speed pictures, or they'll also take video. And because they are infrared, they don't need any flash, and so they they'll work at night, night vi- infrared night vision. And so uh, what happened was is the the forest rangers, these Polish forest rangers or foresters or whatever. They set up these these uh, trail cams to to track game on the trails within this Polish forest, and they went back uh, after a, a while it takes place. They go back to check the the film or the 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 little disc on the um, on the trail cam, and they they run this thing back, and lo, <laughs> lo and behold, they see uh, the tiger, Mr. Merrick H. Uh, prancing around naked in front of the cameras. I don't think he was aware that the cameras were there, but he's down. <laughs> he's completely naked in the woods on all fours, prancing, <laughs> prancing around like a, well, I don't know if Siberian tigers prance, but uh, th- that's what he was doing. He was run- <laughs> running around hallucinating, uh, thinking he was a Siberian tiger in the Polish forest. And they said that he, he did this for about eight hours. And uh, he traveled 15 and a half miles along the Czech 
uh, Polish border in a in a large forested area, completely <laughs> completely naked, jumping around on all fours, thinking he was a Siberian tiger. This is just man, you can't make this. This is this is just this is too much, man. So needless to say, the Cyb uh, the, uh, the Siberian right. Needless to say, the Polish uh, forest authorities or foresters they saw this thing and they immediately uh, took it to the uh, to the police. And uh, the guy was arrested, but because he was completely naked, he didn't have any of the drugs on him, uh, so they only fined him and let him go. They didn't, they didn't, they couldn't keep him for drug possession because he wasn't in possession of any drugs or sanity or clothing. But uh, during an interview, he told the authorities, he told the cops that this was his true personality had woken up in him. And he was always connected with the animal. We, we don't know how or why, or we, I'm not sure we want to know, tell you the truth. And he added that while, while being high on the drug, he picked up a scent and felt compelled, he felt compelled to follow it for 15 and a half miles, stark naked. Um, hopefully, this was, I don't know when this actually took place, but I think it was fairly recent. And uh, I would think that he'd probably have to work up a pretty good lather because it was probably pretty chilly out there in the Polish forest uh, with uh, with being completely nude. So the next time you're out on a hike and you see a uh, naked guy running around on all fours, at least you'll know what happened and uh, that he's high on LSD and he thinks he's a Siberian tiger or some other wild animal. And I guess um, the old saying, that's why they call it dope. So that's all I've got today. I hope you all have a great balance of the weekend. Uh, this is the Common Constitutionalist. I thank you for listening. I'm signing off. I'll see you. Thank you for listening to the Common Constitutionalist Weekly Podcast.